Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 3 Biology Area Study 2. Today we are looking at the dot points of the study design that are related to responding to antigens. So if we look at responding to antigens, um, we are looking today at the dot points about what an antigen is, what pathogens are, we're looking at the first, second and third line of defence. Remember, this is just a summary. Obviously, you would have learned a lot more detail in class, but this is going to uh, go over the main points that you need to know. So an antigen is basically mostly proteins. Some are lipids um, that are attached to a cell and help us identify whether the cell is self or non-self. So they're like a label okay, that are attached to the cell. So there's some receptors for self and there's some receptors for non-self where immune cells are going to be able to identify whether particular cells are part of the body or if they are invaders. So in order to identify whether um, a cell is self or non-self, okay, that's going to help us be able to figure out whether we need to defend against infection. Okay, so Identifying cells or molecules that are foreign or non-self, our body's going to react to try and eliminate them. Where we recognize the body's own cells and compounds and produce them as self, we're not going to react against them. If the process fails and the immune system attacks the body's own cell, then there is going to be damage and that is um, autoimmune diseases that we're going to look at. You'll also be coming across the word allergen. Okay, over this next unit, an allergen is a type of antigen, okay, that causes an allergic reaction with an abnormal immune response, which when we look at the immune response, that is going to make a lot more sense about what is happening. So we're going to start off by talking about what the things are that are invading the body. So the things that are invading, we call them pathogens. Now, we're constantly exposed to different microbes, okay? Microbes are things like microorganisms, they're fungi, they're bacteria, they're protists. Most of them are harmless, but some of them are going to cause infection or disease. So the things that are harmful, we, cause them, we call them pathogenic microbes. So to cause a disease, the pathogen, okay, and we're going to go through a few examples of pathogens, are going to have to gain entry into the body, okay? They're going to have to overcome the defense mechanisms that the body has, so our lines of defense. They're going to have to become established at various sites in our body, and they're going to have to be able to multiply rapidly, okay, that are going to cause harm to the host, and as humans, we would be the host, and produce symptoms of the disease. So in terms of looking at pathogens today, we can split pathogens up into cellular and non-cellular. So cellular means living and non-cellular means non-living. So cellular pathogens, our examples are bacteria, okay? We've also got fungi and we've got protozoa. So bacteria we know are unicellular organisms that can enter the host, so things like E. coli. We know in terms of bacteria there are different, different types. Fungi, they can be single or multicellular and they can produce spores and obtain food directly by absorption. So some examples of fungi causing disease would be yeast infections, um, an athlete's foot through ringworm. Ring and we've also got protozoa. So they are single-celled parasites that are going to resemble animals and may also form large colonies. So examples would be the plasmodium, better known as causing malaria. Our non-cellular pathogens that we looked at were DNA and RNA viruses, okay, and they are infective agents that contain nucleic acids that can only replicate in the presence of a host. We um, discussed viroids, okay, which are plant pathogens, and prions or prions that are misfolded protein particles. Once they get into the brain, they can cause a lot of infection and infect other um, cells as well. All right, moving on to the next part. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to break up the three lines of defense. So our first line of defense is any physical, chemical, or microbiological barrier that is going to protect the body from unwanted foreign material. Okay, so in animals, things like our skin, okay, if our skin doesn't have any cuts on it, it's intact, that's going to form a 
waterproof layer um, that's going to protect things from coming inside. Um, we've got mucus, okay, tears, saliva, they all contain amylases, so enzymes that break down bacterial cell walls. Stomach acid is an example of a chemical barrier. Um, it's a very low pH, so if bacteria gets in there, that stomach acid is going to act to kill that bacteria. We've also got bacteria in our gut that's going to prevent harmful bacteria from growing. In terms of looking at plants, plants have a few first line of defense um, strategies as well. So they've got physical barriers like their waxy waterproof cuticle. They've got stomatal closure. Their cell wall, okay, um, has lignin, which makes it hard to digest. We've got chemical barriers, okay, like our antimicrobial and antifungals that are produced on the inside of the surface of plants. And plants also have active defenses, okay, so once the pathogen has entered a plant, there is also recognition systems for those pathogens um, where plants can release enzymes that can result in cell death. So first line of defense is our first um, sort of barrier, and those barriers can be physical, chemical, or microbiological. If a pathogen passes that first line of defense, we then have our second line of defense. Now, the important thing about the second line of defense is it's what we call innate or non-specific. So it is a natural response from the body, and no matter what the pathogen is, the body is going to react the exact same way. So in terms of looking at this um, innate and non-specific, the first line of defense can also fall under this category because it's reacting to every pathogen the exact same way. There is no memory of prior infection. Okay, So it's non-specific. Um, these non-specific defenses are going to react to the presence of a pathogen regardless of what it is, and white blood cells are going to be involved in this response. So our second, of line, de second line of defense is focusing on microbe, en en microbe entry after it's passed that first line of defense, and it's made up of a number of parts, okay, that are these white blood cells. So we've got phagocytes. They engulf and absorb bacteria and other small cell particles, and we're going to go through um, phagocytosis. So those phagocytes are white blood cells that are ingesting microbes and they digest them through a process of what we call phagocytosis. So first up, the phagocyte is going to detect the microbe, okay, um, by chemicals that are going to be released and those microbes are going to stick to the phagocyte's surface. A phagocyte is then going to undergo ingestion Okay, where it's going to wrap around those microbes and engulf them, forming little vesicles. Okay, and this is what we call now a phagosome. So a phagosome is a phagocytic vesicle, which is going to enclose inside of it all of those microbes. We then have fusion with a lysosome. Remember, lysosome is involved in um, destruction. Okay, so the phagosome fuses with a lysosome, which has lots of powerful enzymes that are able to now digest and kill the microbe, um, so the microbe is going to be broken down, and we then release that material from the phagocyte, okay, once that's all been broken down. So phagocytes are a major component of this second line of defense in terms of digesting um, foreign substances. Macrophages are an example of a very large phagocyte. Neutrophils are smaller phagocytes, okay, and they're the ones that are first to arrive at the site of an infection, and they release what we call cytokines. So remember, cytokines are that signaling molecule that are going to be involved in um, getting other cells to come to the infection site. We have mast cells, okay, mast cells are also involved in the allergic response, and they release histamine. We've got dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are what we call messenger cells, okay? So they're found in the skin and lining tissue, and they are what we call antigen-presenting cells, okay? Do not get this confused with a dendrite, okay? A dendrite is part of a neuron. A dendritic cell is not part of a neuron. The dendritic cell is part of the immune response. We then have what we call complement proteins. So complement proteins are a group of proteins that are helping the phagocyte recognize foreign antigens. So remember, antigens are on um, the surface of every 
pathogen of every cell. Um, and so if the cell is being recognized as non-self, okay, um, it's these complement proteins that are involved in recognizing that. So they stick to the invading microorganism and they can become readily identifiable as foreign to those phagocytes and they're going to attract more phagocytes to that area of infection. Like I said, those cytokines that are released by neutrophils, okay, are signaling molecules. In terms of looking at those complement proteins, okay, they form what we call a complement system and they work in three ways. They cause three outcomes. So they do what we call opsonize pathogens, okay, where they stick to the surface of the pathogen. They attract phagocytes and they also create pores in bacterial membranes, which we call the membrane attack complex or MACs, okay. And these form rings and put a hole in bacteria and can cause them to rupture as well. All right, moving on now to inflammation and discussing that. So inflammation occurs when there is an immune response that's initiated by these physical, chemical or microbial agents. Okay, so not necessarily a pathogen, could be anything that is going to cause some swelling, it's going to cause redness, it's going to cause pain, and it's going to cause heat, which are our four characteristic um, characteristics of inflammation. So the inflammatory response has the following functions. Number one, to destroy the cause of infection and remove any remnants from the body. We are then going to confine the infection to a small area so that it's not going to spread everywhere and to replace or repair tissue. So you can have a look here, you can pause the video and read through the process of inflammation. I'm just wary of time as these videos cut off at 15 minutes. The third line of defense now can be broken up into two segments. Now the third line of defense is what we call specific, okay? It is specific to specific cells, okay? It's not just going to react the same way um, to every pathogen that comes in. And like I said, there's two components. There's the humoral and there's the cell mediated. So the humoral response involves B cells and the cell mediated response involves T cells, which we're going to go through. So in terms of looking at B cells, B cells are involved in humoral immunity. So this is where a foreign antigen is going to activate a particular B cell by binding to surface antibodies and the B cell is going to multiply to form either memory cells or plasma cells. So plasma cells are the ones that are producing antibodies and memory cells are the ones that will, if we are encountered with the same pathogen again, be able to rapidly reproduce those antibodies, okay, again. In terms of looking at what a B cell is, they are formed in bone marrow, they mature in bone marrow, and they're involved in the humoral response, and they are responsible for the production of antibodies. Now, antibodies match up with antigens, so they are specific and they bind to antigens. Each B cell is only going to produce one type of antibody, antibody, so they are very specific. Okay, so when we're looking at the third line of defense and the production of antibodies, we are looking at each antibody only able to be binding to a particular antigen. So if we look over here in terms of the structure of an antibody, all right, we've got a constant region but then we've got a variable region. So for every antibody, this variable region is different because it is going to bind to a specific antigen. And this over here is where the antigen recognition site is. This over here is a summary, again, going over humoral and cellular, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, immunity. Um, and there's a video link in the description that goes through this quite well as well. In terms of looking at the third line of defense, we are focusing on T cells. Um, T cells are formed in the bone marrow but mature in the thymus. I'll let you have a read through the process of cell mediated immunity, but it involves cytotoxic T cells and it involves T helper cells, which you can see over here. 
The final part of this dot point is looking at the lymphatic system. So I'd like you to pause this video and you can read through the roles of the lymphatic system. Any questions, leave them below.